from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. We believe the AI center of gravity for enterprise value creation is shifting from LLMs to SLMs, where the S not only stands for small, but encompasses a system of small, specialized, secure, and sovereign models. Moreover, we see LLMs and SLMs evolving to become agentic, hence SAM, i.e. small action models. In our view, it's the collection of these S models combined with an emerging data harmonization layer that will enable systems of agents to work in concert and create high impact business outcomes. These multi-agent systems will completely reshape the software industry generally, and more specifically, unleash an entirely new productivity paradigm. Hello and welcome to this week's theCUBE Research Insights, powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, we introduce you to our newest analyst, Scott Hebner, who is covering AI deeply in causal AI. And along with my colleague and principal analyst here at theCUBE Research, George Gilbert, we'll update you on the state of Gen AI and LLMs, and we'll revisit our premise that the long tail of SLMs will emerge with a new high value component in the form of multiple agents. Let's first review the premise that we put forth over a year ago with the power law of Gen AI. The concept is that similar to other power laws, there'll be a long tail of specialized models with Gen AI. And in this example, size of the model is on the y-axis, model specificity is in that long tail. And the difference here is that the open source movement, the difference from conventional power laws, the open source movement and the third party models, you know, beyond the big hyperscalers and open, open AI and NVIDIA, they're gonna pull that torso shown in red up to the right. And we highlight meta in red for reasons that'll become clear in a moment, but this picture is playing out as we expected, albeit slowly where enterprises are in search of ROI. You know, they're, they're tempering their payback expectations and realizing that AI excellence isn't as easy as making a bunch of API calls to open AI models. And the reason we highlighted Meta in the previous slide is that as we predicted, the open source momentum is highly impactful. This data from ETR shows net score or spending momentum on the vertical axis and account overlap in the data set of more than 1600 IT decision makers. That's on the X axis. It's a proxy for market penetration. And that red line at 40% indicates a highly elevated spending velocity. Let's start with Meta and Llama specifically. Notice the table insert in the upper right-hand corner. Now this is preliminary data from the ETR survey that's in the field now, it closes in October. I got special permission to use the data. Look at Meta, with a 74% net score, it now has surpassed OpenAI and Microsoft as the LLM with the lead spending velocity. Now we've grouped these, these, these companies in cohorts in the diagram with these red circles. So let's start with Meta Anthropic. You got the open source and third party, which we, as we said before, pulling the torso up to the right. Now in the leftmost circle, we show the early AI ML innovators like Spark, Spark Cognition, Data Robot, C3 AI. You got Data IQ in there, H2O.AI. And then the big legacy companies represented here by IBM, Watson, and Oracle, both players in AI. And then we show the two proxies for the modern data stack, Databricks and Snowflake, also both in the game, and then AWS and Google who are battling it out for second place in mind share and market share going up against Microsoft and OpenAI in the upper right, which got all this started. I mean, they are literally off the charts. So first of all, Scott, welcome to our studio in Marlboro. Thanks for coming up here. Any thoughts on what you just saw? Yeah, I mean, it's really fascinating to see that data. And um, I would add to that as I look through some of the data, um, over the last year, these enterprises actually went from 34% um, investment in uh, AI and ML, that's specific to their business, to 50%. So in one year, a 16 point growth. And when you look at the velocity of spend across all the different technology categories that we've been looking at, ML and AI are by far the, the highest velocity of spend only container technologies and some you know, robotic automation um, are even close to it. So there's no doubt that there's a huge amount of investment going in by enterprises to build or source their own AI models. You know, 
in yeah. Belmont. And, yeah. and we'll talk about sort of how those are being funded in a moment. But George, let's bring you into the conversation. I know you got some thoughts on frontier models. You've been following this very closely. What are your thoughts? Only thing I would say is um, mm. it's very clear with, with Meta Llama 3.1, the 405B model, it's now a frontier class model. It's GPT-4 class. Um, but along Scott's point, to reinforce the notion about the elevated spending momentum, what's become clear in the last 12 months is that the real um, the real use cases so far for Gen AI are customer service and software development. And, and we can get into that later why. But most of the other people who are struggling with pilots and trying to get into production are trying to piece together a whole bunch of components into a system which mainstream companies are just not equipped to do. And so what we're seeing or we're going to see is ISVs building the systems, building these components into their systems. And that's where we're going to see adoption in the form of agents. Yeah, you're right. I mean, a lot of the applications are very sort of chat GPT like. And so let's talk about the state of Gen AI spending. This chart shows the latest data from the most recent ETR drill down survey on Gen AI. Now we've previously in, in breaking analysis shared that roughly 40 to 42% of accounts are funding Gen AI initiatives by stealing from other budgets. The figure is now up to 45%. And the new dimension in this latest data is that lines of business are major contributors to the funding as, as we show here. The money's coming from business apps, this sort of generic non-IT departments that, that uh, is cited, outsourced services and marketing budgets. The point is that business lines have major skin in the game and that's where the real value, the real ROI is gonna be recognized. Now, the other vector that we wanna explore is just that ROI and the expectations. Initially, when ETR started surveying uh, around Gen AI ROI, the expectations were much more optimistic for faster returns as we're showing here. Notice the yellow bar in the more than a year category. It's jumped up from a low of 14% in April of, of last year uh, when folks were more opti optimistic. It's now up to 25% of the survey base with the percent of customers expecting fast ROI now under, six, uh, under, under uh, uh, t uh, 12 months dropping uh, pretty notably. So we expect this to continue. Scott, any any thoughts that you have on this? Yeah, I think what you're starting to see a little bit is the uh, disillusionment that happens with all technology transformations. The hype gets a little ahead of the reality. Things step back just a little bit and then it will take off again, right? And I think you're seeing, part of what I think you're seeing in the llama, um, you know, velocity increasing so much is the momentum behind open source, right? The ability to customize, the ability to have a greater degree of transparency, um, and build, you know, the, the ability to integrate these things together right, and orchestrate across models and you know, co as compared to open AI and Microsoft, right? And part of that is, is in reaction to what they're finding out with these models, right? Is you got to be able to have the transparency and, and the customization to a much greater extent than they have. Then that will ramp back up, I bet. Yeah. So, uh, Alex, bring that same slide back up if you would, because I, I just want to point out again, we're seeing this shift shift right, we always talk about shift left, we're shifting the ROI to the right. And and then you can see that more than a year, it's 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 just really jumping up and you can see on the left-hand side, you know, the three months, the four to six months, people were really sanguine early on. You saw you saw back in January of 2024, 25% of the base said we can between four and six months. So inside of six months, that's, that's pretty significant. And then George, you basically again alluded to a lot of the use cases are you know pretty straightforward. But anything you would add to this commentary? I think what's going to happen is that as Gen AI becomes a feature, um, it's we're going to realize it's a sustaining innovation in the sense that in Christensen's terminology, um, it helps the incumbents because it does not require a transformation in business model, it, at least not initially but it enhances their current products. And as we'll talk about, it can enhance them incrementally, but in a very substantial way so that people can start getting more value out of incumbent products rather quickly. So 12 months from now, I think we're gonna see that start, that whole chart start shifting left when people realize they can get incremental value rather quickly, not by building bespoke Gen AI systems, but by adopting 
um, the Gen AI features in their existing products. You know, and that's one of the reasons why oftentimes we talk about that the, this era of AI is more like the internet than, say, for instance, the cloud. While the cloud was very disruptive, it, not everybody could necessarily take advantage of the of the cloud. Whereas the internet, if you took advantage of it, it sort of was a tide that lifted all ships. Let's let's get into the future scenarios a little bit and revisit our block diagram of the new multi-agent application stack that we see emerging and shown here. Let me start at the bottom here. You've got these two-way connections to the operational and analytic apps. And then you've got this ab above that data platform layer, which has been sort of popularized by the likes of, of Snowflake and, and also you know, Databricks, who has really you know, owned that whole Spark you know, channel. Ab above that, we see this emerging harmonization layer. We've talked about that a lot. And then you've got multi-agents, ops, and orchestration, the whole idea here is this not a lot of people talk about single agents. We're talking here about multiple agents that can work together and they're guided by top down key performance indicators and, and, and organizational goals. You can see that on the upper left in that sort of tree diagram. And the whole idea here is it's so it, the agents are working in concert, they are guided by those top down objectives, but they're executing on a bottom up you know, plan to meet those objectives. And then the other point is, unlike sort of hard-coded microservices, these swarms of agents can observe human behavior, which can't be necessarily hard-coded, and then over time learn and then respond to create novel and even more productive workflows in real time and become a real-time representation of a business. George, um, this is something that you've talked about. Before we get into the multi-agent piece, Scott is going to double-click on the harmonization layer, and then we're going to come back to you, George. So, so Scott, why don't you, you, you take it here? Actually, before we do, George, anything you want to add, if you bring that chart back up, uh, Alex, and, and sorry for the little pivot here, but anything you'd want to add to my narrative about this? You kind of introduced this to our community, you know, several weeks ago. A anything I missed? The only thing I would say is Every application company and every data company is going to be introducing their own agents. And customers will be able to deploy these and get incremental value, whether it's talking to their enterprise data through natural language or uh, more easily building workflows in their applications. But what they'll quickly find is that they're just reinforcing the existing islands of applications um, or automation and, and analytic data. And, and it's this broader framework that's going to need to be put into place gradually over time before you get to the, the more transracial productivity of having end-to-end -end integration and automation. Okay, we highlighted that harmonized data layer. It sits above the, the, the data platform, the modern data stack. Sometimes it's called the semantic layer, which we feel like is sometimes misunderstood or, or, or a misnomer. Um, let's double-click on that harmonization layer. Scott, walk us through this slide. Yeah, this brings you back to the whole analogy of the iceberg, right? The agents are what you see above the water. Underneath the water is the big part of the iceberg. And when you, especially when you think about moving from a semantic design to an intelligent, adaptive design, that's gonna then fuel these agents on behalf of people. So if, as you look at this chart here, when we kind of break down this layer, um, there's three core pieces of it. Um, obviously, it sits on a data and AI platform, right? Think of a data fabric plus the ability to build um, AI models off that, manage, govern, all the things that you're going to need to do. And at the core of the of the operation here are these large language models, right? And they could be um, self-sourced within your own organization. They can be open-sourced and customized, or they can be um, public source or closed source using the APIs um, from a variety of providers, I think more and more you're going to see large language models that are customized and optimized for a particular business. Think of these large language models as being the heart and soul of the system where generally applicable um, data and information resides, cross-company information, um, and more of the, the you know solving world peace kind of um, queries that someone may want to do. Um, where it's going to start to get really interesting is when you bring in the small language models into the mix. And as Dave said earlier, you know, S means small, but it means specialized. It means sovereign. It means secure, right? 
And there is going to need to be an ecosystem of these small language models that are then going to partner and collaborate with the large language models to really make the bottom of the iceberg work on behalf of the agents. So what, what's starting to happen here increasingly is while you may have a large language model or several large language models, you're then going to do the derivative works of that to create the, um, the small language models, right? And then from there, you're going to be able to build into them the knowledge graphs that represent how these different entities work together in the relationships. And then from there, causal models that actually understand the mechanics of cause and effect. And what's going to happen is as you cycle around the ecosystem of models, it's going to self-educate each model. So the way the LLM gets smarter is through the small language models, and they feed off each other over time. It's an architected ecosystem of models. And then what sits on top of that, of course, is the layer where you're able to um, actually orchestrate and build the agents, the multi-network agents, uh, that then feed and become the agents that George was talking about. Right. Thank you for that. And so this whole system becomes autodidactic, self-learning. And George, um, you know, a lot of people, I don't want to say poo-poo the harmonization layer, but maybe under, understate the importance of it. I wonder if you have any comments on what Scott just presented. Yeah, Scott made an interesting point because I think, um, like for many decades, we we had two personas building applications. We had the personas building the data model in the database, and then we had an entirely different persona building the application logic in a very different application. And for the most part, those they existed in two different worlds. And I think the same thing is happening here, where what Scott is describing is this um, this causal layer, which is a it's a digital twin of the business. And then the agent guys are like the application guys, only they're now small applications. They're task specific. Um, but what the, the two personas need to work together synergistically, and we'll get into this in more detail why, but if the agents are operating with a view of the business that's not synchronized with what other agents are doing. In other words, if they are not working on a common model of the state of the business and what might happen if, if an agent changes the state and how it affects another agent, if that's not all orchestrated together, then the whole system doesn't really work. We do not know how to test these things. No one's certainly tried to test them working across vendors because they're not deployed anywhere across vendors. So the point we're trying to make is that this knowledge layer that represents the physics of the business has to be built out somewhat in conjunction with the agent layer that um, is responsible for specific processes or tasks. They build each other synergistically. And I think we're going to go into that in a little more detail. So it's not only, Scott, self-learning, it's an organic system. Um, you had another comment. Right, exactly. No, it mimics an organic system. And I think one of the most important points is that many of the approaches people take today is they have human beings that are trying to create workflows and processes that represent how they think the business works, which may not necessarily be how the actual business works. And you won't know that until you get into discovering the very complex causal drivers of your business and how things relate from a cause and effect perspective, why things happen, how they happen, what you can do to change them, right? Counterfactuals, confounders, in interventions. Then that learning is then going to get factored back organically through the system and the agents become more effective, right? And they know how to collaborate in a more in a more organized, intelligent way. And, and it also potentially addresses the tr what I call the tribal knowledge problem. Oh, Scott left the company. He took all this you know, domain knowledge with him, not even domain knowledge, just how stuff works. And to your point, that may not be actually how it works. Mm -hmm. So if you go back and try to figure out how Scott did it, there may be a better way. And you're, the system will actually inform the, the folks that are remaining at that organization, perhaps what a new process could be, or you know, some of the other blind spots could be unveiled. Yeah, I mean, Dave, gonna... let me oh, Go ahead, build. If I can build on, on Dave, what you were just saying, actually, on what you were both saying, the idea of this system is that it captures the expertise of of the people who work with it, and just as you were saying, 
the tr the tribal knowledge so that let's say a, a domain expert wants to build an agent or a metric around which an agent will learn to optimize its behavior they they can't go to the equivalent of today's central data engineering group to build a pipeline to feed it with data and they can't go to um, a data analyst to to build the metric instead they use they they compose the metric let's say customer churn in business terms and then the pipeline to feed that is generated on demand because there's an underlying model. They don't have to build pipelines. Then the agent is built by someone in customer service who expresses the rules in natural language and connects that agent to the goal of reducing the customer churn metric. And then that, that expertise is captured in this set of artifacts and it learns over time how to do better at reducing churn yeah, and I think that's right on. And and you know, the another interesting point here is the way this operates today is um it's based on statistical correlation, right? Based on historic data. That's the way these models historically are trained. Um what what's challenging about that is correlation is about a static world, the probabilities that are encoded. But causality takes into account what change, what, how do the probabilities change when the world around it changes in a dynamic world, right? And all businesses are dynamic worlds. So this, this new focus on causal AI is going to take the knowledge models to a whole new level, which is going to take the small language models to a whole new level. And the, the, the bi-directional feeding here is going to make the LLMs even more intelligent. And again, that gives you that underpinning of the iceberg that's under the water that gives you the infrastructure to then build these agentic systems on top of so we go back to well over a year ago now when we introduced this concept of Uber for all, and it's been a theme of ours, where you're, you, you've got people, places, and things, and that digital representation of an organization in real time, This we're starting to see how LLMs and agents can evolve to support that that vision uh, and make it real. What we'd like to do now is, is, is double click on the other part of that that chart that we read, uh, put in red highlights, and that's the agent control framework concept. George, take us through this slide and, and walk us through specifically a use case, if you would. Okay. So agents will need an agent control framework. It, one analogy might be an API gateway that organizes agents in an org chart of functional spec spec specialization. So in our example, we have a consumer interacting with a customer service agent about a product return. Um, and the customer service AI agent um, tries to avoid um, escalating to a human for the routine interactions. It communicates with the orchestration agent seen above at the top. That knows how to connect the um, customer service agent with an order management and a warehouse uh, system set of agents to figure out what inventory can be delivered, say, as a replacement for the return. And these other specialized agents, they use the harmonized business layer to reason about inventory order status and logistics using common assumptions. This is a critical issue because there are many who believe that agents can talk directly with the unharmonized data and application estate, but we believe you can't operate this um, multi-agent system, uh, certainly uh, across multiple vendors, agents. You can't do this with reliability um, unless they're working with a common language about the state of the business. And it's also much easier to train agents if they're working on a common language about customers' orders, inventory, return policies. They will then operate more reliably, precisely, and faster. And those are the key attributes that distinguish probabilistic agents versus traditional symbolic code. You need the synergy between that harmonized business layer and the agents to give the agents more reliability, precision, and performance. And Scott, that sets up your notion of the static versus the dynamic world. Right. Right. I mean, you know, simply put, today's AI is, you know, correlation. It's probabilistic statistics. That's that's how it works. It identifies patterns, associations, anomalies, and from there it can make a prediction, it can forecast something, it can generate something. Um, but when those when the world around it changes, right, 
how do the probabilities change, right? And, you know, humans are causal by nature. Businesses are causal. The world's causal by nature. And so AI has to adapt to understand cause and effect and the science of why things happen and what to do about it. And given a whole bunch of options of what to do to improve something, which is the best option? That's a dynamic world versus what we're operating today is a static world. And George, you know, what he just said is it requires increasingly a more dynamic set of underpinnings to make that happen that continuously learns, like you said, organically. And I think that's where this is heading in the years to come. The years to come. Mm. It's going to be taking all the piece parts, the LLMs, the SLMs, the knowledge graphs, the graph rec. We have all these methods and tools. They need to come together architecturally under the covers of these, you know, these, these agent systems. And that's what's really going to just keep incre incrementing the ROI as we get through time here. And Scott, if I can add one thing, Dave. Yeah, please go ahead. That, that um, what what Scott is describing so um, so well and from so many perspectives is what ultimately we need to capture in the metric tree because it's the relationship between these measures of business. They can start out as simple formulas, but they become much richer, more dynamic, more probabilistic relationships. Um, how do I drive more customer acquisition. It's not a mechanistic thing. It's something that changes over time. And, and that's, it's reflected in the underlying harmonized business model. That I think is where Scott's framework and mine um, meet and how we can flush this out over time, because um, that's, it's, it's a, a learning system. And in the language of business, you make plans um, that have causal assumptions, and then you do business reviews to see if your assumptions were right, and those learnings get incorporated back into the business model for the next planning cycle. Yeah, and just to render that explicit with an example is, it's one thing for the models to say you have a customer churn problem. Yeah. It's another thing to say the root cause of that problem is this. That can't really be done today, because that require, root cause requires cause and effect in the understanding of causality. Um, and then once you understand a root cause, the next obvious question is going to be, so what do I do about it? Given countless different actions I can take, which is going to result in the best outcome? And I can now model that with what if. And these agents are the ones that are going to be helping you model the what ifs. So again, the causality plus the knowledge graphs, plus th these ecosystems of small language models that are domain and task specific, being wired together that then feed more intelligence into the LLMs. Um, that's the architecture of the future, I think, at a very simple level. And, and it's running those what ifs and then proposing the next best action or plans, multiple plans, some of then presenting those to humans, some of which may not be feasible, some of which would be, and then that sort of iterative approach. All right, let's discuss some of the uh, ecosystem implications. We, we took that agent stack that we showed earlier, the multi-agent system, we simplified it and we tried to superimpose, you know, some of the, the logos here. And I think we've been talking now about this, this horizontal, I'll call it uh, platform. And when we talk about Uber for all, the whole idea is the Uber, you know, wrote this system, this, this highly proprietary system for its own purposes and applications. The vision we have is that, that any company would be able to tap these types of capabilities and and deploy this type of intelligent, you know, software if, in, in data apps in a way that they could drive new business. Now, what we see emerging is you've got existing application vendors, you know, like a, a, a Microsoft or a Palantir or a Salesforce that are actually, you know, building in this diagram, Salonis, Palantir, and Salesforce, they're playing in both that harmonization layer uh, as well as the multi-agent uh, orchestration and, and agent operations layer. So this is a built upon today's data platforms, whether it's Snowflake, Databricks, AWS, Google, you know, Microsoft, other you know, uh, uh, data players, et cetera. And then you've got, again, for instance, Palantir and Salesforce within their application domains, building these harmonization layers uh, as well as the agent capabilities. And you've got firms like Relational AI and Enterprise Web. Uh, we put a, a UI path, the Workado as well, working on 
being able to horizontally enable these types of systems for any uh, applications in, in any organization. So George, uh, what are your thoughts on how the ecosystem evolves generally and specifically what some of these companies are doing? I didn't mention Google, but they're playing. What's your take on all this? I know you're very close to it. I, I would only add at the very bottom layer something that's interesting that's going on. You and I, David, have talked about um, could the data platform vendors be hitting sort of a value ceiling because it's not, we've always talked about, oh, there's a semantic layer coming. But when you look at the difference between the data platform and the, what we now call the har harmonized business model, it is so fundamentally different technically that it's not a layer you just um, sort of organically put on top of a data platform. It is an entirely different database system. It it, it is an uh, and it goes from what's a relational database to a graph database, and not only a graph database, but it marries those two separate worlds of ap application logic and database persistence and transactions. We haven't had a new layer this fundamental in enterprise software since the early 70s with the rise um, or the emergence of the relational database. It's a very, very different layer. And then on top of that, we're adding the agents. So we're, we're really getting two layers at once. And that's a, a very powerful transition that the industry is going through. And if, if you go back to that slide, I just wanted to make a point. Uh, two things. One is I forgot to put Oracle on, on here. I'll, I'll add that. Um, because very clearly what we saw at Oracle uh, Cloud World is is they're pursuing this. And the second thing, George, to your point about uh, knowledge graphs, you, you get the expressiveness of a knowledge graph, but the query simplicity of SQL and, and the flexibility, which we've we've not had uh, before. So, uh, Scott, you wanted to comment on this. Yeah, I was just going to make a comment on the harmonization layer again. And um, if you think about what's most important there is three attributes for an enterprise, right? It must understand the unique language of your business, right? In the industry you operate in, in the regions and your cohorts. So it's about the language being unique. Two, it's about workflow. It's about automation. Every business has unique automation needs and different processes that they have to go through. So it's unique, right? And then trust and transparency means something different to every organization, different policies from a corporate perspective, from regulatory, so on and so forth. That is what I think is driving this rapid growth in open source models. And in fact, if you um, kind of look at the AI marketplace now from a model perspective, open source is actually growing faster than the closed source. And if you look at Hugging Face, for example, they just surpassed recently a million models on, on, on Hugging Face. About 80, 90% of them are open, are open source. Um, and that's what's going to allow you to build unique language, unique automation, unique, unique trust and transparency because they're highly customizable. They tend to run on a private cloud if you want them to have, be sovereign. They give you a lot more flexibility. And like the last many big transformations, ultimately open source and open standards um, became the reality of the industry. And it's going to happen here too. Interesting. Gents, thank you so much. I don't know if any other final thoughts, uh, chime in now, speak now, forever hold your peace. Okay. I would Go give ahead, you one quick, quick thought that some people are saying, oh, this is, you know, more starry eyed, um, <laughs> rocket science. Right. But if you look at the, at the initial agent building tools from say Salesforce or Microsoft, um, they're really just taking their existing low-code tools and they're having Gen AI substitute for the what otherwise would have been a procedural decision tree in choosing how to invoke existing workflows. It's very, very incremental and it'll grow from there. But the point is we, we have basic technology, not starry-eyed ra rocket science for people to get you know started with like right now. That's why I think the agent piece will take off. It may not be what, you know, AI researchers call agents, but it's going to be productive for corporate developers. Yeah. And I'll just, my, my final thought is um, just, you know, once again, AI is so much in its infancy right now. This is going to be a long-term journey. 
Um, but unlike previous transformations, it's moving probably twice the speed. And you, you always have to spend half your time on what's the next frontier, what is coming next, start preparing, make sure you have the skills in place. Doesn't mean you have to start spending a lot of money on it, but don't find yourself in a very fast moving um, technological cycle here, falling behind. Um, so always balance where the ROI is today, but you gotta be thinking ahead one step forward of where the ROI is gonna be tomorrow. And I think what's been outlined in this whole conversation is this architectural approach to, to the agents through the SAM, right? The ecosystem of small language models and the large language models and the AI platform increasingly open source you're seeing all the piece parts that are going to come together architecturally, I think, as we go through the years ahead. Interesting. And, and I just, I, I would add that, yes, the pace is so fast, but it's kind of trite to say this. It's sort of bromide, but it's, it's the truth is it's the people in process part of the equation that ultimately slow down adoption. And if you look at, you know, big waves of technology, it tends to take a long time, even though, you know, the, the progress uh, is, is very fast and like, like we always say, like nothing we've ever seen, the adoption uh, has other complexities. And so to your point, you really got to think about the skills and the impacts on the organization. Guys, thanks so much. Great work. Uh, George, Scott, really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, that's it for now. Thanks to Alex Meyerson and Ken Schiffman who are on production and do our podcast. Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight, they help get the word out on social media and in our newsletters. And Rob Hof is our EIC over at siliconangle.com. Great editing. Thanks, everybody. And remember, all these episodes are available as podcasts. We turn them into to, to, for your listening pleasure. Wherever you listen, just search Breaking Analysis Podcast. I publish each week on thecuberesearch.com and siliconangle.com. You got a pitch? Send me an email, david.vellante at siliconangle.com or DM me at dvellante. Comment on our LinkedIn post. And by all means, check out etr.ai. They keep innovating. They've got the best survey data in the enterprise tech business. Awesome time series data. This is Dave Vellante for Scott Hebner and George Gilbert for the Cube Research Insights powered by ETR. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis.